Thanks for tuning in to another telecast. Before this week's show, I wanted to remind you to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV industry news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts, and exclusive access to some live telecast events we're planning for the months ahead. And you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list. And don't worry, we don't like spam either, so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it to advertisers or anything. Just sign up at our website by searching Telecast on Google or visiting telecast podcast. Dot com. Thanks a lot. Telecast, the TV industry news review. How does Vice Studios stay relevant in a time of expanding choice for viewers? What lessons might TV leaders be able to learn from their counterparts in other industries after COVID? And how can they effectively step back from the day to day to assess the new landscape of opportunity? On this week's telecast, I'm chatting with president of Vice Studios, Kate Ward, on what she's learned in the pandemic and how Vice Studios has weathered the storm. Also on the show is leadership coach and strategist David Lansfield, who works with the likes of NBC Universal, Channel 4, the BBC and the NHS, as we discuss how TV leaders can prepare to go again and accelerate out of the COVID crisis. It's all coming up on this week's telecast. My first guest on this week's show heads up the studios business for a media company that's revolutionized content production for younger audiences and arguably set the template for impactful short-form documentary making as well as wider content. The business started as a magazine in the mid-90s and has evolved into a multimedia empire covering publishing, TV channels, a multi-channel network business, content production, a studios business, and a distribution arm, to name a few. I'm sure there's a few more that I've missed out there. Here to discuss the studio side of the business, I'm delighted to welcome Kate Ward, president of Vice Studios. Welcome to Telecast, Kate. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Now, we've, we've seen the impact that Vice has had on the traditional TV business, I think, and how it disrupted the status quo. And Before you joined Refinery29, which Vice bought a couple of years ago, you spent seven years at Shine Group. Can you take us inside Vice and give us an overview of how you do things differently at Vice to perhaps more traditional TV industry businesses? I've been incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to to experience two kind of on the surface different businesses in the Shine Group and, and, and Vice Studios, they have at their core a lot in common. Fantastic creative people, brilliant ideas, a deep passion and commitment to kind of creative excellence and, you know, are, are both global and in so many ways that, that, that was, that's very influential you know, to me in taking that job is those those experiences at Shine, not least working with um, Alex Mann and Liz Murdoch and, and all the other incredible leaders that, that we had there, Jane Featherston, Kelly Webland, too many to, to mention. But I think Vice Studios has a unique position and a unique opportunity. We're born from the Vice Media Group. So part, as you say, of, of this kind of blue chip media company that, that's really designed for now and for the future, you know, the publishing team are incredible, global. We have 35 offices around the world. They publish 1,400 pieces of content a day. So we sit on this kind of treasure trove of of intellectual property, of of access, of areas of authority, whether they're driven by motherboard or tech, um, reporting team, Munchies, our incredible food team, Refinery29, and all the incredible work Um, that they do and of course you know you couldn't talk about Vice without Vice News you know have won you know Peabody's DuPont's and and more Emmys than than I've had hot dinners by many times Um, so we're born from this incredible creative ecosystem we're global and that's 
a fantastic advantage. I mean, my team is in Mumbai, is in Mexico City, London, Toronto, LA, New York. But we also have, through our wide advice team, kind of a network to pretty much every country in the world and, and, and have produced content everywhere around the world. But we're nimble. We are really, really, really agile. We share ideas quickly. We collaborate. You know, we are really kind of modern in our approach. And I think that flexibility kind of marks us out as something different. And ultimately, and I think fundamentally, that the, the thing that, that really drives the point of difference is our point of view. Vice is a creative first company built with a very, very simple premise that we, we tell stories others don't tell with access others don't have. It's a bold, future-facing, progressive, youthful voice um, that really, really seeks to address the subjects that, that are shaping the world for young people. It's for people that want to spark curiosity um, and, and that are making the world their own. And we reflect um, all of that with a very distinctive uh, editorial tone of voice. Vice became known as... The outlet, the magazine, and as you say, Vice News, of covering stories that nobody else would cover from a completely different angle, almost a different type of journalism, wasn't it? And I think that that is something that obviously sparked the success of the business. And I think it's termed as immersion journalism or uh, basically individuals living an experience and actually reporting on that experience and sharing that with viewers. Is that something that's still very much at the heart of the Vice editorial approach? I think that the it's the absolute signature of Vice News that they're immersed within the story, that, that they are they are reporting from the ground, um, that they break the fourth wall, that they're they are they are there in the thick of the story. I think for Vice Studios, you know, we have that that DNA, that journalistic DNA, that desire to go further. But I think we also reflect our kind of cultural media entertainment side of the business as well, which is that kind of predictive engine of culture. I think what defines a Vice studio story is, is we're always looking for character. We're always looking to, to push right to the edge of culture. We, we maybe can see something from a slightly different angle, bringing in humour, bringing in... Um, analysis just trying to do things differently but also and I, I think this is important you know Vice Studios is, is really built our business by being a, a platform for incredible talent you know we are absolutely honoured to work with the directors and, and writers that we do and I think that really we've, we've been able to build because we've been a great place for talent to realise their vision and, and a great kind of creative first studio. How do you keep things fresh and relevant and how do you not get disrupted yourself in a world of social media, expanding choice, expanding channels, individuals creating brands around themselves? How do you not get disrupted yourself? I can speak for the for the Vice Studios piece and I, and I look on and I'm, I'm always astonished at at, the, at the, the brilliance and the power of, of my colleagues in, in the digital side of the business, Corey Haken and, and her, her team, you know, really they are the predictive engines of culture. They've been at the forefront and continue to be. And I think it stems from this idea that Vice is really a community brand. It's not just us telling, we reflect the work and the world of our, of our, of our audience, of our creative partners, um, of our teams. And so we're really in a kind of really, really, constant dialogue with all of them and and really that allows us to push forward i think studios is it's interesting because you know we obviously run on a on a longer lead time let's say i mean i wish i think and i wouldn't be the only um tv executive that, that, that's probably come on the podcast saying i wish it could all speed up but i but we you know we work on a on a much longer lead time um we're hardly publishing 1400 pieces of content um a day i, I wish we were our job, I think, is to see, to take these trends, these themes, these subjects and, and push them out. Um, we're really here to make things that, that are impactful today, but, but have that kind of ultimate evergreen value that lasts out till for many, many years to come. And I think when you look at, what, at our, some of our, our big kind of hits, whether it's Fire Festival, or Jim and Andy, you know, you really see the impact of those lasting far beyond the kind of immediate, very, very significant audience impact that they had when they came out. And they're just as relevant, just as fun, and just as great to watch today as they were then. 
Can you talk us through Vice's content strategy, or Vice Studios, should I say, content strategy now? Because it's a time of massive change. It was before the pandemic. It's just, you know, put that change on steroids over the last 18 months or so. Scripted content has been very difficult to produce, although some people have been still been able to do that. Factual content has gone through the roof, and that's really always been Vice's mainstay. What's your content strategy for Vice going forward? Because you're in both camps. Is that something that you're looking to further build on, on both sides of the scripted and unscripted fence? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, Vice Studios was born, you know, originally from being a feature film division. Vice Films, I think, were originally um, called. And I think that that multi-genre approach has always been central to us and continues to be. I think when we look at our focus, you know, feature film is, is an important part of what we do. Scripted series um, and scripted podcast is a, is a, is a really important part um, of what we do in the scripted space. We have a fantastic team and a slate that, that both has real strength and depth in terms of English language projects, but also projects that reflect Vice's kind of international footprint projects that are born from work that we've done in, in LATAM and across Europe and, and, in, and even in India. Um, on the unscripted side, we, we split our efforts really into two. One, a kind of dedicated docs focus. In the US, we were really proud to, to hire Janet Gargi to, to lead our, our docs team in the US. He's an incredible executive and, and documentarian. And we also have a kind of unscripted um, kind of broader nonfiction focus that, that can see us do anything from quiz shows all the way through to Obdoc and, and and reality. So we, we really are operating across all genres. I think when we think about our content strategy, that those are the places that, that we play, but we always come back to, is this a vice story? Is this about great character, great access? What's it saying about, about the world? So those, those, those editorial points guide us, I think, more than the form. And I also think that as the kind of boom in, in, in factual content or non-fiction content, as you say, you know, increasingly that will look like genres coming closer together and docudrama hybrid is, you know, becoming a, a, a really important area. I think we've done some excellent work in that space um, for Vice TV with Dark Side of the Ring, where we do both great, re, great recreations as well as some, some great doc work, but also thinking about hybrids between comedy and reality. And, and, and so we really do think about the idea first. I think the other thing that, that really is at the heart of my approach is, you know, just emphasizing the global nature of our business. We've really um, doubled down on growing our business in India. That's been incredibly successful. And, and we have multiple shows there in production, including Indian Predator, which is a, a, a huge true crime um, coming out on Netflix later this year, which we're incredibly proud of. So I think both multi-genre, um, our distinct point of view and our global footprint, that, that, that those are really the three pillars of, of what we're setting out to do. Another good example, I think, of your unscripted catalogue was Lords of Chaos, which is a Norwegian black death metal movie directed by Jonas Ackerland, who's obviously a famous video director. And that came out a couple of years ago. And that presumably itself was driven from a, a previous Vice story, I would imagine. You're absolutely right. IP is, is really at the heart of our creative approach. Um, we're so incredibly lucky to, to, to both work with, with those individual stories, but also those authority areas um, that we get thanks to being part of the Vice Media Group. I think when you look at Fire, that came from original reporting done on the, on the site um, but but we are also constantly um, working closely with our colleagues um, on the digital publishing side, developing programming with them, um, but also using the kind of wider kind of authority areas that that, that have been um, developed and hard won by the company as, as places for us to creatively play. So we really do um, benefit hugely from that, and, and it is an enormous focus for us. Now, we're talking about unscripted and, and scripted content, but when it comes to other platforms, when it comes to social platforms, and again, we're looking predominantly at a youth audience or a younger audience. If we're looking at Vice on YouTube, 
Snapchat, are you on all of the key social platforms? And and if so, how do you monetize your digital content? Well, I mean, I can absolutely guarantee we are. I mean, that the the, the social um, short from digital content, it, it's it's not my remit, but but an area that I do oversee um, is distribution in, in a more kind of traditional TV form. So we we launched a distribution company. Um, headed up by B. Hagelis in, in July last year at the height of the pandemic. And I, I think people probably gave us a bit more credit, <laughs> me a bit more credit for that than I deserved in the sense that I, I, I felt I, I was late and everyone else was saying, genius, they've launched a distribution company just as production grinds to a halt. And that business, I think, has really taken off. It's been a complete rocket ship, so much more um, even than, than we could have hoped for. And I think what you're seeing in that business is, is just the, the kind of, ecosystem the kind of huge range of places that that you can distribute content to meet this kind of ever-growing appetite for for unscripted content vice has about a thousand hours in our library Um, we've launched uh, a fast channel which is out on samsung tv plus and roku Um, we we've launched partnerships with with pretty much all the major avod platforms um, in the us uh, done very big landmark deals with with main broadcasters channel 4 sbs in australia um, and we have, of course, our international TV channels business with it, with a channel um, with Canal uh, in France and with Sky and Z in, in New Zealand. So we really are kind of thinking about distribution in the widest possible sense. But similarly, I guess, to my colleagues in digital and social, really meeting the audience where they are and pursuing a kind of fully diversified distribution strategy with our long form programming as, as we do with our short form. Every business has needed to adapt. And this is an overused term, but pivot uh, during the pandemic, um, what have you had to do differently during the pandemic, and what have you learned over the past sixteen months or so that you'll take forward after this is all over, or until we 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 adapt to this new way of living? Well, you know, I'll, I'll answer that question on a personal note if I can. I mean, I think it's the longest period that I've ever been kind of in one place, certainly. Prior to this, I was, you know, in the US sort of every six to eight weeks and flying here, there and everywhere in between. So this is a sort of prolonged period, not on a plane. And I think we've all had to adapt to that. I think I think you've got elsewhere in the podcast kind of some discussion about, about leadership. And I think that, you know, learning how to lead a team completely remotely has been challenging and also you know rewarding as we we get better at using that muscle and obviously excited about thinking about what a what the kind of future of work looks like um I think we've also learned about the incredible resilience creativity and innovation of our teams their determination to capture stories to 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 continue to make and produce incredible television we we produced a significant amount of content last year in different places at different points and all with incredibly rigorous guidelines but the need for the teams to constantly innovate to be flexible and just the sheer dedication that it took to get those shows on the air is something that will stay with me for a long time and I think you know necessity is the mother of invention but it, but it's something that was frankly inspiring to see not just at vice but the whole industry and and you know keeping that spirit of innovation and doing things differently alive will be one of the one of the things that i personally look to take forward from this period for somebody who's involved in an international business and this is something that again you know i've spoken to a previous guest on the show about is you know you may not be traveling internationally but you're still having FaceTime with international colleagues. And that means that many senior executives have been at home longer, as you mentioned, but also longer into the night, particularly if you're doing calls in the States and and particularly if it's a West Coast. Have you felt that your day has extended from early in the morning to late into the evening? Have Have you felt that you've worked longer hours personally during the pandemic it's a blessing and a curse right I mean I think living in London and doing the job that I do is perhaps surprising and maybe you suspect that I would be based in LA um, or New York 
um, uh, where the majority of our, our studio's business is, is, is driven from our LA office, very, very ably by um, Danny Goodbye and Vanessa Casey, who run our US business. You know, that it's been a real pleasure to some extent that, that, that there's no longer, without meetings in person, my, my location is no longer a disadvantage for me to be in certain meetings and pitches, which is, which is awesome. You don't have to wait for the LA trip to do what you want to do. So that, that in some ways is great. I'm a big fan of my my LA days, as I call them, my late nights sat at my desk being with my team and it works for me. And on the flip side, I have snatched more moments with my young family. I mean, I had a, my second baby during the, the the lockdown one, so I've snatched more precious moments with them than, than I probably have done at other times, pop downstairs and share a sandwich over lunch and occasionally nip out to do the school run. So I think... Um, it's been a case of being flexible and I think Nancy has set a great example and, you know, recognise that that there are those moments of needing to be flexible. Um, but I certainly know that, that lots of people have had their LA day stretch out into the night. I, I, I must say I relish mine and uh, love spending time with my team. So they're a regular feature and they have been and they were pre-pandemic and they continue to be. So I think that's just my life. <laughs> Yeah. Well, congratulations on your new edition. Thanks. Yeah, um, lockdown, Louis. Yes, that's interesting. You mentioned, and I think many uh, international TV execs will recognise that, you know, saving up projects to take out to LA or going out, you know, planning your trip ahead in, uh, to LA over a number of weeks and then going there and you pin a lot on that. Do you think that working remotely has sped up the decision-making process of, of you as a business or do you think it's not made, made much difference has it streamlined decision-making through necessity my studio's business is super international and I live in London so you know a, a lot of my time was always remote so I hope for my teams their interaction with me has been bis- relatively business as usual without the the FaceTime that, that 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 we so look forward to as a, as a broader team I don't know, Justin, honestly, if it, 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 if I can say that, that that's made a, a difference. I think there's an enormous value of, of getting together, creatively spending time together. Um, I also, as I said, admire and have enormous respect for the resilience of our teams to operate internationally, globally, um, to collaborate across geographies, across cities. And, and there is a lot of that global collaboration um, and communication that happens at Vice Studios that, that was there before and will remain after after the pandemic. I'm not sure it, it applies in this, to us in, as much as maybe others. Can you tell us some of the new scripted and unscripted projects that you've got in the pipeline at Vice Studios that you're most excited about? You know, what, what's what's coming up? There's probably more than you can say at this point, but I'll point to one that I'm incredibly proud of, which is that we're in production on a uh, on a ESPN thirty for thirty, um, which is which is the story of the history of American Gladiators, directed by an incredible director called Ben Berman. And I think you know thirty for thirty is just such an iconic sort of platform and such an iconic slot for for ESPN and and to be in such great company with those other films um, that have been in 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 that company is is, is awesome. Ben is an incredible director and it's a, a, a wild and fantastic story. So we're really, really excited about that. We are airing at the moment Dark Side of the Ring, uh, new Dark Side of the Ring season three, which is just absolutely phenomenal and has such a kind of huge following all around the world. And, and you know, that's been... That's been absolutely brilliant. And, and also this year, we're so proud of um, Pride, which, which recently aired on FX in the US. And I, I don't know when it's coming to the UK, but, but, but please, please watch out for it because it was an incredible landmark documentary which charted the history of the LGBTQ plus movement. And I think it was extraordinary. So we were, we were incredibly proud of that and, and proud to work with all the directors and killer films um, on, on that project. So yeah, the, and, and there's... Lots and lots more, but but I'm I'm bound to uh, bound to silence um, and but more to come. We, we've been we've been very very busy and, and are really really excited about about what next year is going to hold for the for the viewers at home. Well, we look forward to seeing what's coming up from Vice Studios in the weeks and months ahead. 
And now it's that time in the show for Kate to pick her story of the week, the TV industry news item that's caught her eye in the past seven days. Kate, what's your story of the week? My story of the week was from The Hollywood Reporter, and it talked about that the EU was considering proposals to exclude British programmes from EU quotas that would have a big impact on the UK film and TV sector into the EU. It was a bit of a bolt from the blue. I mean, there's a number of things at play here, aren't there, in the fact that EU has quotas for at least 30% of titles on video on demand platforms such as Netflix and Amazon to be of European origin. And now the UK is not part of Europe, then maybe we could see that reducing, which is quite terrifying when you think that the EU is the second biggest market for British content after the US. It's clearly not resolved. And I guess there are many steps to go until it is resolved. But I think, you know, it's obviously concerning when you think of the impact and the growth that the, that the British TV sectors had, and as you say, it, you know, that especially for, for high-end sort of scripted projects, the, the co-pros, et cetera, you know, it, it, it seemed like a, like a worrying story. But I, I, I suspect that there'll be time to, to work through it. But I think more broadly, you know, what we've seen is that kind of boom in content from all over the world. And I think, you know, other stories I could have chosen would point to the success of of non-English language and of international content on the streamers and and coming to the UK. So I think, you know, one hopes that that this can be resolved, but also it's a good time to be in a content business. There are more eyeballs and I hope that that this will be resolved because I think there should be more opportunity for, for everyone. And now it's that time in the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Kate, who's your hero of the week? Joint heroes of the week Michael and Emily Evis and the BBC Glastonbury I've been going every year for as long as long as long as I can remember and the last weekend in June is Glastonbury weekend for me obviously not happening this year but thanks to the BBC I spent um, some very nice times reminiscing on iPlayer and and watching it on the TV and and wishing that that I was uh I was in front of the pyramid stage, so that's they're my heroes of the week and a bit of much welcome light relief and uh, reminiscing about what it was like to be in a, a big crowd having a having a dance. So yeah, they're my heroes of the week. I'm going to get you on the hoof here. What's your favourite Glastonbury moment? What's oh. what's the ultimate moment that you that, that you have at Glastonbury that stays with you? It's probably unbroadcastable, but I. <laughs> I was very lucky once I got to see a, a headline set on the pyramid from side of stage. And that was, that was pretty amazing to look the other way out into the crowd. And uh, yeah, I won't, I won't forget that in a hurry. So that, that was pretty cool. What band was that? I think it was, it was madness on a, on a Sunday afternoon, just having a little look out. Fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Um, it was really great. But I think I've had too many memories to mention. And yeah, certainly watching it all on the TV. I was like, oh, it's there. I saw that one, saw that one. I think Oasis was probably my best ever. Certainly don't miss the mud. It was raining all day yesterday in London. and uh... I'll take it. Mud, sun, <laughs> hot, cold. <laughs> uh, any, t- any chance to be on Worthy Farm, I'll take. <laughs> okay. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin, Kate? I struggled to find a person in the whole country that wasn't thinking that they had to tell Matt Hancock to get in the bin. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to be a, a Matt Hancock in the bin this yeah, week for me. Yeah, yeah, I think he is. And for international listeners, I mean, you've, everybody internationally is probably seeing the uh, the UK. Google it, international listeners. Yes, yeah. The UK Health Secretary caught on camera in a uh, steamy embrace whilst telling people to socially distance. So I think, you know, nobody likes a hypocrite, do they? So uh, there we go. That's our political bit of... Yeah. Uh, that's my political answer for the day. <laughs> yeah. It had to be Hancock. Hancock's half hour. There we are. Kate, thank you so much for joining me on Telecast this week. Really enjoyed chatting with you. All the best with Vice Studios and everything that's going on. Obviously, your fledgling distribution business, which probably isn't so fledgling anymore after what is, I'm sure, a very busy first year in existence. Thanks again for coming on Telecast. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. 
Now, my next guest on this week's show is a leadership coach and strategist who helps business leaders transform themselves and their businesses. And he's worked with lots of businesses within the media and TV industry, as as well as lots of others. He's worked for NBC Universal, Channel 4, the BBC, the NHS, and many other blue chip organizations. Welcome to the show, David Lansfield. Thank you very much, Justin. Wonderful to be here. Lovely to have you on, and thanks for spending some time with us. As a leadership coach who deals with transformation, you must have had a pretty busy time during this pandemic as all of these leaders and all these businesses and all these different sectors you work in have been thinking, how do we keep this uh, train on the tracks? How how has it been for you the last few months? Yeah, I think it's. I've been made my own transition from being from being a sort of partner in a consultancy into my own new business, and that's a transition in itself. I've been obviously dealing with my own personal challenges of homeschooling, but also my work with leaders. Um, I guess I've observed that leaders are more open to a more personal conversation about their own resilience, about mm. what matters to them, about how they interact with people in a, in a way that's uh, deeper than perhaps before. And at the same time, they've had to make critical decisions um, in terms of financial performance, dealing with difficult HR issues. And so it's been intense at times. It's been more rewarding, I think, than perhaps previous times because you can see the immediate effect. And I think think it's required of them, and I hope of me, um, greater wisdom. And I don't say that with arrogance, but I mean, at times you have to just pause, think, breathe, reflect to think deeply about what the right thing is to say or do, particularly in environments where people are candidly traumatized at times through personal you know, difficulties and, and worse, um, sensitized to the environment and looking for a degree of hope. So wisdom has been something that's been a forefront of my mind and of the leaders I've worked with. Yeah. As individuals in small organizations, as well as you know, really, some of the really big organisations that you deal with, that feeling of kind of uh, distance, I suppose, from you know uh, those of us who are used to going into offices every day with colleagues, and that's been part of the the day to day work environment. That's taken away, and as you mentioned earlier on, everyone's or many people have been dealing with homeschooling and various different external issues. That must have been an issue for many people as well, just that feeling of belonging, I suppose, being taken away. If you swipe yourself into a big office block every day and that's taken away, there is a, there's a little bit of self-identity goes with that. Yes, I think for many of us, whatever size of organisation, work is a very large part of our life and our identity. Uh, and there's, you know, at best, you, know, you enjoy being around other people, you learn from them, you know, have fun with them and so forth. And whilst there are some benefits and have been some benefits for many people um, of spending more time at home with family, getting to know neighbours and so forth, the sort of um, what, is, what is my relationship with my organisation beyond the physical presence that I have? And I think many people have been asking questions and I've been working with them on, okay, how much do I want to give to work? What are my relationships at work? How many of them are strictly professional and will stay there? But once I'm out of that bubble, how many friends do I actually have? Um, and how much, if you like, do I need to try and create, a, uh, if you like, a, what I would call a reservoir of trust amongst people? Because if you're not around people physically sitting next to them, you have to trust them more, trust them to deliver against whatever it is, the objectives, the plans, the results, you know, the projects, the ventures you're involved in. And if you can't see them, you have to find a way to perhaps talk more often, at least at the beginning, um, share what you're doing. And actually perhaps be more open about some of the challenges than perhaps you were before. Because those moments of bumping into people in corridors, the serendipity, you know, not, are not as easy to manufacture. And what I've seen at the best, I've seen many organizations and individuals do this, which is they've actually had proper conversations about what their focus is. You know, what are they there to do? And what does success look like? And what's the rhythm of work? to the degree that they haven't needed to do that before because they can see each other, you know, um, visibly. So actually, Mm -hmm. I think it's been in many cases a positive enabler, but there are times when people are, and I found it myself at times, you know, you get more lonely um, because you're spending more time on your own and having a 
video or audio call, which many people have done too much of, um, we can still use the telephone and we can still use other forms of contact beyond just using Zoom or other platforms. I think you have to find a way to work out, um, you know, your own inner strength and actually what's meaning to you, which may sound all high and mighty, but actually I think many of us um, look to work and our relationships at work for validation um, and a degree of recognition. And that's positive to a degree. But if your whole psyche is based on, you know, having a high five from somebody, getting a, a applause, getting, you know, getting that buzz at work and, and, a, and you sort of need that, it becomes a bit addictive. So I've been working with an executive recently where he's actually found the time quite difficult, not only because he's missed people, but it's like, how do I know what I'm doing is, is right and good? And what, what we've been talking about is how can he have more meaningful, thoughtful conversations with his colleagues about the outcomes they're trying to deliver and actually what they're there to do? It's been a period of self-reflection, hasn't it, really? I mean, yeah, as you say, what am I doing? What is my business doing? Down to the fundamentals of do I actually enjoy what I'm doing? Can I see a way forward with it? So, I mean, it'd be interesting. Actually, it'd be interesting to see how, how many people have changed jobs Ver, uh, during the pandemic versus beforehand i'm sure there's some stats somewhere about that i'll have to maybe have a look there'll be some people who frankly have have, have had the time for reflection and you know and in some ways lucky them some have had to do it for necessity right in terms of i need to make some immediate decisions because i've either lost my job or i'm not going to frankly get paid what i expect to get paid or my progression's not as fast there's lots of different contexts i, mean, I guess we need to be careful that we don't assume that everything's been rosy for people because many people yeah. have suffered financially career-wise and obviously health-wise i think many people have a higher expectation of their organization and the leaders that they work with and for because you spent more time outside the work environment the physical environment i think it's given a window on life that for many people has been positive others actually hasn't been <laughs> so there have been quite a lot of stats around you know marital challenges and so forth but I think if you're a leader of any organization, in particular, you know, the TV industry and the industry I love, I think there is a greater need to articulate what we stand for, um, what I expect from you, the culture of the organization, which have always been important. But I think now people are more expectant. And I think they also want to get a sense of, is this a person or a group of people that I really want to give my attention, my time and my energy to? From a business perspective, in the UK and in the US, and, and we know there are lots of European countries and uh, are starting to catch up when it comes to vaccination and things are hopefully you know going all in the right direction, many of us are starting to look beyond the pandemic now. Yes. And those particularly, probably particularly in large media organizations, particularly those actually that, that are probably driven from the US might start to feel that inevitable pressure again from above to ramp up operations and make the earnings and mm. and accelerate out of COVID. A lot of leaders, a lot of people in leadership positions might be feeling a bit ragged around the edges, you know, after dealing with everything that COVID has dealt us. How should leaders of big and small content businesses prepare to go again and really, you know, start to scale the next mountain? Yeah, I think firstly, they have to find the right moment and the right words to convey the fact there is a shift in calling time on the crisis, as I call it. I don't mean they have to become scientists overnight, but there is something about we're now moving into a new phase. Um, and I think before you move on to the, okay, here's our new targets, here's our new plan, come on, go again. Um, there are some important words and feelings that I think have to be conveyed around recognition for people's time and efforts and going above and beyond i guess an honesty about the state of the business about how strong strong it is how resilient it is um, and what the opportunities are and i guess also as i said earlier a sense of aspiration and hope about what the business and organization could become assuming that it's not in not in distress and i think very very importantly there is a personal commitment that leaders need to give around learning the lessons from their interactions with customers within the organizations rather than just slipping back to what the organization was before the pandemic or just if you like sleepwalking to the next phase so there will be lots and lots of lessons around 
how you work smarter, how you have worked in a more virtual environment that you may want to continue. There's maybe some things you want to stop. But I think before moving to the next stage of, come on, let's let's get going. Let's make sure we deliver results because shareholders will be expectant. There is a, I guess, of what I call a holding of the of the of the organization and a care for the organization. And the leaders will need to convey that to their boards and their investors to say, look, we have some choices. We can either push, push, push and actually get a short term, potentially a short term you know, uplift in performance. But then we're going to slip back because we're going to suffer. Again, we are people businesses from the lack of energy and resilience. Or actually, we're thoughtful and wise about calling a close on this chapter of our or our business and in and and uh, this sort of period and then moving forward and then i think it's about being strategic about where the organization focuses i know there's a big focus on hybrid working how much time in the office and so on which is important i understand that but there are i, I would argue there are as important if not more important questions about what the business is there to do focus no point having great working environments if you're focusing on the wrong customers or you're pricing in the wrong way or you're developing the wrong formats and i don't think there's been enough focus on the if you like the strategic and commercial questions that complement the cultural questions after all in whatever size of organization you are and whatever geographic market um if you took a fresh look around you the landscape will will look and feel quite differently so um, business will have gone under, some will be stronger, particularly some of the platform-based technology companies will be stronger than before. Um, others may be, may be weaker, um, talent may have moved. So there's something about once you've called a close on that, on that period of life, actually having a fresh look at the landscape around you. And then very importantly, as is in all good strategy, making some conscious choices and articulating them clearly to the people around you. If if you're listening to a leader, you want both confidence and appreciation but you also want clarity about what are we going to do next what are our choices and very very importantly and this goes to your point justin about energy and resilience what are we going to stop doing and what are we not going to do which is rarely conveyed we often always focus on the next thing the bigger thing the bigger thing and it often becomes overwhelming and it's the why as well isn't it i suppose yeah. and that's the opportunity now for those leaders to have those sort of conversations it's it's like you know before it might you might have felt part of the big machine and you know you're just one of the cogs in it and great i'll get my pay rise at the end of this year and maybe hopefully get promotion every couple of years or but actually now as you said there's a fundamental opportunity for reinvention you use the term core time on the crisis so to draw a line under it and say okay we can now reimagine who we are and what we do. Some organizations may have thousands of employees. Yes. So you need to take them with you, don't you? And, and now, and after this huge period of introspection that people have had, it's reigniting the flame a little bit and reinventing for the new chapter, isn't it? Absolutely. And there will be, I think, many people who've actually thrived and done pretty well through the pandemic. I don't say that insensitively. And these are not people we tend to focus on. But there will be many people in organizations who will be, you know, raring to go, have actually not just, you know, been reflecting, but thinking, right, I want to take the business forward. And I think for any leader, the question now is, how do you harness that energy? Who do you involve in that reimagining? And how do you position it? The language really matters. If you're in an organization that's, you know, frankly struggled through the pandemic and somebody says to you, we're going to reimagine the organization, I think many people would roll their eyes and say, oh, not another one. Mm. If, however, you framed it as an opportunity to do good work, better work, to work smarter, and you invite people to share their own lessons and their own ideas, and you do that meaningfully, it's not just one of those summer away days where you have a few hours and then you go back to the, the, the business the next day, but a proper process of dialogue, discussion, and exploration in, in the business. And very importantly, involving people from different backgrounds and walks of life, not just the top team, not just the obvious suspects, but people who have perhaps people right on the front line of the business, you know, the creatives, the commercial people, the lawyers, you know, whoever it is, mix up the people, ask them some simple questions about opportunity and growth avoid the buzzwords. And then very importantly, when new ideas come forward and new energy is conveyed, really back it. So I think it is an opportunity for leaders to play more of a role of a curator and framing these these sort of dialogues 
rather than being the sort of the person who they've often had to be during the earlier stages of the pandemic, you know, the hero or the person right at the front saying, we're going to do this. I think now there's a shift of leadership style that we need to have, which is more listening, more convening and more enabling of their people. Yeah. That also helps with the leadership team refreshing themselves. As we, we're talking about emerging from this pandemic gradually, but we're also emerging into a new world, aren't we? We've had Black Lives Matter happening. We've had lots of different cultural changes that have happened over the last year, which is actually, you throw it all together with the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, and so many other major cultural changes that it's, it's going to be seen, I think, as a as a real watershed moment, isn't it? And the leaders that have the vision to be able to take all of those learnings and, and reinvent their businesses as somewhere that people now want to work. People may now have a different requirement of the businesses that they spend their time with. I think that's right. I think mindset is critical throughout this. I think a mindset of openness to think of the business afresh if you, as if you're a newcomer or a new investor in the business and say, look, let's not forget our strengths. It may be the, the brands, the relationships you have, the quality of the content, the technology um, that you, you, you use and, and deploy, whatever it is, you shouldn't ignore that. It's very easy when you talk about fresh starts to try and create something too new. So you start on your strengths. But there also is something about saying, hey, let's look at the context we're in. Let's look at our customers. Let's look at our our supply chain partners. Let's look at the societal issues. Um, Where do we want to play in that space beyond shareholder value and making money in the short term? What is our responsibility? And how do we want to contribute to solving some of these societal issues? And I think many of those, the, the topics you've included, as well as income inequality, which is a major issue, climate change. And many of these topics have been accelerated through the pandemic uh, in terms of their, you know, their implications and their impact. I think gone are the days where businesses can just sort of rely on others to deal with it. And I think many of us as employees want to get a sense of, okay, what do we stand for on societal issues? And what are we practically doing about it? We were talking earlier about you know, Alex Mahon at Channel 4, who I think has done very well through the pandemic i mean communicated brilliantly and communicated a more personal level than many other ceos about her own challenges um but also uh, my view is she's used it as an opportunity to sort of if like double down on diversity and inclusion as a topic yeah not only because it's channel four's remit in the uk but actually it's a business opportunity to to say this is central to our strategy I've mentioned Alex before on the show and, you know, she has been very visible and really played a leadership role for all of the industry, I think. So it's been, it's been, uh, you know, very inspiring to see that. You're working with lots of businesses outside of TV and outside of the content industry. Are there any other leaders that you've dealt with in other industries that, that any lessons that we can learn from leaders in other industries that might be interesting for the TV industry to look and go, actually, that's a really interesting approach. Or, uh, And that could be anybody from, a, I don't know, petrochemical giant or anybody else. Is, is there anybody that, that you've, you know, anybody that you've noted, but any, any changes that you've seen being made from, a, from an external industry that you think actually the TV industry could take some good tips from them? There's individuals that I've admired in terms of what they've stood for and what they've done. I mean, Alison Rose, for example, who's the CEO of the NatWest Group, used to be Royal Bank of Scotland. That's a challenging organisation in terms of the legacy of challenge she inherited. Um, but what I've, it has impressed me is how she's communicated clearly the role and responsibility of the bank and its and its divisions in helping SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Now, you can debate how well they've done it, but she's gone on the front foot and saying, this is our role, this is what we're doing differently, and this is how we want to help. So she not only, if you like, delivered on what's expected of her business, but sort of, to, to, a bit like Alex, taken a broader stance in saying, actually, we have a responsibility. And when she communicated, and I've seen her on the platform a number of times, it wasn't just big picture themes. 
if she really went into the detail of you know de- either dealing with complaints or improving the way that you know, SMEs are dealing with the bank. You know, if you like the combination of being what I call on top of the business on big picture issues and in the business has been critical throughout the um, throughout the crisis. You know, that's one person I think is you know has in has impressed. If you look at the you know the CEOs of Zoom and and Airbnb, I mean they're big names, but they've had big challenges in different lights. You know, so Eric at um, you know, Zoom clearly it's done incredibly well, but it's had some teething um, problems along the way. And what I've admired by him is the honesty and openness to sort of say, we've got it wrong. We've got it wrong at times. We're doing our best to fix it. And the immediacy of that communication and the honesty and transparency, I think, has gone a long way. And I think um, in terms of, you know, Brian at Airbnb, I mean, that is a business that's had to make many, many, many decisions um, in a very short of time to, um, to pivot as a business. So whilst communication is important, Brian and other CEOs have had to make important strategic commercial decisions to change their business. Um, and this is not something you can spend years on. You have to do it in a matter of weeks and months. Um, and I think that takes courage. I think that takes sort of clarity of mind. And I think it also means, you know, assembling the right team around you. So some of the leaders I've worked with during this period, I think they've been very smart about getting the right styles and and styles of people around them. You know, not just the people who are, want to make decisions immediately, more reflective thinkers, people who've had experience outside their industry, people who perhaps are fresher to the organisation. The diversity of perspective in a leadership team has been absolutely critical to making sensible and wise decisions, often at, at real pace. It's the time for casting the net a bit wider isn't it from a leadership team it used to be the case of you know oh you just employ somebody who could do the job better than you kind of thing we used to be the the, the sort of advice but now it's en- enabling a wider sort of uh reflection of, of the wider issues that are that are out there i agree and i think one of the topics that any leadership should be considering always and especially now is what is our real role? What are the things we should really focus on? What are our capabilities? And if I give you a quick example of a company outside TV, another example of a company outside the TV sector and space, a company called Hire, which is a company that's been studied. It's a Chinese equipment manufacturer. It's much more than that, but that's the simple description. It has pioneered a management model of distributed, what are called distributed responsibility, proper empowerment, responsibility so yes it has a top team pretty small top team that sets direction you know manages performance but effectively what it's created is a series of entrepreneurial networks you know quite small teams that are there with very clear bounds and guidance right so they they know what they you know if like what they can do what they can't do but they're there to make money to obviously to delight customers and the the top team is there to set the direction and obviously listen to those teams, um, set the sort of tolerance around return and risk, all those things. But it's not there to do the classic you know, management role day to day, which many leadership teams still do, whatever they, whatever they tell you. The reality is still they're pretty immersed in the business. They see their role as finding the best talent, supporting them, and letting them, if you like, use their entrepreneurial spirit to their best. And I think that's quite a radical shift for many many organizations, particularly traditional organizations, where there's a sort of rhythm, the monthly meetings, you know, the long days, full full agenda of, of operating items and so on. And I think there's a question for any leadership team, which is, okay, what are the two or three roles we play? How can we empower the organization much more? And effectively, how can we spend more time, if you like, outside the organization, exploring new relationships, new ventures, learning from people inside and outside the sector. One of the things I've said in one of my recent articles in Harvard Business Review is, you know, executives need to spend more time at the edges of the organization, not just the classic, I'm new in role, let me go and see what the people on the front line, whatever they are, you know, the creatives, the, the, um, the people doing deals, what they're telling me, and then they go back to the corporate center after a month or two, and then they devise the strategy, and then they roll it out. We're in a mindset where actually they've got to stay there, spend more time there, and actually give the, if you like, give the pen, in inverted commas, to others to write the story, to d- divert the, you know, the direction of the particular team or the operating unit. 
that's a pretty big shift, I think, in mindset and leadership style. But I think it's necessary. And Hire is a, an example um, of a pioneer in that space that's done incredibly well in all senses. That's quite brave as well, isn't it? To, yeah. to actually, as you say, you know, give the pen to, to, to somebody else. So there is something about starting in the right place. So I think this is not something you do overnight, but there is something about finding either, you know, the right individuals, the right team, and actually piloting something and saying, you know what, let's, we're going to try something different. And it may be in a space that you're more comfortable with, but my, every time, also my own experience of being a leader, every time I've tried to do something different and I've explained it clearly as to the what I, my intent is with some of my team and I've given them the resources and I've given them the support and also being willing to accept some mini failures mm-hmm. often the failures aren't failures they've just done it differently into <laughs> the way I've done it but I've considered it mm-hmm. a failure um mm-hmm. actually they've thrived right mm-hmm. so there is something about genuinely giving more responsibility being more transparent in terms of what you're looking to do and then very very importantly giving people more resources there's no point in sharing responsibility if effectively they they have their hands tied behind their back they have to be given resources which could be people money time space and it also means that they have to a lot of the machinery that clogs up many organizations you know the processes the sign-offs the the governance yeah. need to be simplified in order for people to try the new stuff. Let's hope that's one of the positive developments Indeed. Indeed. coming out of COVID. David, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been really fascinating to hear about your take on leadership and uh, your experiences and, and the leadership that you're seeing and admiring. You mentioned Alex Mahon. You had an interview with Alex, so we'll put a, a link to that on YouTube in the uh, episode description and also one or two of your recent articles on uh, Harvard Business Review. So it's been wonderful to speak to you. Thank you, Justin. Brilliant. Thanks, David. All the best. Thank you very much. Well, that's about it for this week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. Another quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you might have missed, downloadable reports and surveys, and exclusive insights and opinion. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next Thursday, as always. Stay safe. Thanks for listening to another Telecast. A quick reminder to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts, and exclusive access to some live telecast events we're planning for the months ahead. And you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list. And don't worry, we don't like spam either, so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it on to advertisers or anything. Just sign up at our website by searching Telecast on Google or visiting telecast-podcast.com. Thanks a lot.